Of course, it's, it's no accident that the modern day women's movement, the you know, uh, gay liberation movement, the environmental movement all sprung out of the anti-Vietnam War movement. Right. And, and so, so just as Vietnam in this country served as a catalyst for P, and, and in fact, the whole counterculture for that matter. Yeah. yeah. The whole counterculture. Yeah. Um, and, and, and what climate change does is yeah. that, that offers exactly. that for the whole world. Yeah. Because people can get, get start, oh, climate change, that's bad. Well, let's do something wow. about it. Why isn't the government doing something about it? You know? Gee, you know, these powerful corporations have all this influence, and this is going to again radicalize a, a whole generation globally, yeah, right? Uh, because of the urgency of it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a future on wax and wings. I'm your host Keith Runyon, and I'm sitting here today in Santa Cruz with Stephen Zunis, professor of Middle Eastern politics and international relations at the University of San Francisco. Stephen is well known for his outspoken criticism of U.S. foreign policy and specializes in research on the use of non-violent civil resistance as a means for overthrowing oppressive regimes. This conversation has lots of gems in it. We discussed Stephen's transition from radical movements to radical scholarship, what he learned from his work with movements in Kenya and Western Sahara, and how global warming might serve as a catalyst for a global revolutionary shift in political consciousness. I've asked Stephen to sit down and talk with me today about revolutionary strategy, international politics, and the future of civil resistance. Stephen, welcome to the show. Great to be with you. So Stephen, I'd like to give our audience a bit of a chance to get to know you better. Uh, what's the story of how this young boy from North Carolina came to become a leading scholar on nonviolent revolutions and Middle Eastern politics? Well, I grew up in a pretty political family. Uh, my father was an Episcopal priest who had, um, by the time I was four, had um, uh, was no longer had a, a church because he kept uh, being uh, driven out of town because of the civil rights activism. He went back to a grad school and um, um, spent the rest of his career working in physics and astronomy, uh, initially at the University of North Carolina and then later at Durham Tech. And um, <clears throat> but they were very uh, they they were Christian pacifists who um, were very much involved in the leading struggles of the time: nuclear disarmament, the Vietnam War. Uh, they are one of the very early people who uh, got involved on, uh, on on Palestine and uh, opposition to the Israeli occupation at a time when most liberals still had this kind of romantic view of, uh, of, of Israel. And uh, so I... <clears throat> I picked up from them a, 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 an interest in, in the world. I recall, you know, we watch um, Walter Cronkite every night over dinner, and I pretty much taught myself to read by reading the newspaper. <laughs> and so I was a very political animal, and um, <laughs> it was no, no surprise that I was a, um, um, a major in, in, in government and at uh, Oberlin, uh, where I went as an undergraduate and and spent some time working with some radical Quakers and others in, in Philadelphia on a variety of issues, including um, the, uh, the movement against nuclear power, which was uh, very prominent in the late 70s. And, <clears throat> and that, was, that was the movement for a new society, Yes, right? yes, that was the movement yeah. for a new society. And I also worked with Friends Peace Committee and Mobilization for Survival, which was a, um, a, a national disarmament uh, organization. And <clears throat> But I, I realized that my... Um, I uh, was a better intellectual than I was uh, an organizer, mm. <laughs> and um, I was getting a little tired of voluntary poverty <laughs> and uh, <laughs> wanted to. Uh, um, and I just realized I I, I didn't I, um, I I that you know the the revolution wouldn't come quite as soon as I'd hoped. So I, I wanted to um, you know look at the, the big picture and, and mentoring and teaching. It you know, seemed like a natural for me. I grew up in a university mm. town, um, uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and so I, you know, I had a lot of friends whose 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 parents were, were professors, and my father was more professional staff, uh, but um, he later taught at a community college, and so I was very comfortable uh, with with that role, and uh, so I, I uh, after. <clears throat> so I, I, I entered um, grad school at Cornell, uh, got my my doctorate. And after teaching uh, for a time up in Washington State, initially at Whitman College, University of Puget Sound, I ended up uh, with a, a tenured position at the University of San Francisco. 
uh, but my uh, my my interest, I I was um, focusing on U.S. Middle East policy. I think came in part because um, you know my parents' involvement in Palestinian issues and and the like. And my father actually you know served for a time as a um, uh, the advisor for um, uh, Arab students at the mm. University of North Carolina. Yeah. So I. I, I got to, um, <clears throat> even back then, there was quite a bit of stereotyping mm-hmm. <laughs> about uh, Arabs and Muslims. And um, so I got to know you know, a, a bit about the, their, their culture and, 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 and their history and, and, get, and more importantly, as, as individuals. Um, but I had a feeling you know, this would become a major issue in foreign policy. I, when I was actually back at uh, UNC giving a lecture a few years ago, there was an exhibit uh, at the uh, Graduate Library on the history of the university. It's the oldest state uh, university in the country. And for the 1960s, they had a picture of Moratorium Day in 1969. And um, there was a picture of this um, you know, uh, shaggy-haired uh, 13-year-old kid in a, in a paisley shirt uh, with a sign that said, U.S., get out, get out of Vietnam, stay out of the Middle East. And I recognized that kid was me. Yeah. E- even back then, I had a feeling that we were going to end, our, end up in a, a nasty uh, situation, <laughs> uh, Vietnam-type wow. uh, quagmire yeah. in that part of the world. And so I am. Um, so even though I, I at Cornell, I, I didn't ma- I didn't focus on the Middle East. They didn't really have much of the Middle East program there at the time. Um, I was more of a general uh, international relations, comparative politics uh, kind of person. Um, I drifted more and more towards uh, the study of uh, North Africa and the Middle East, uh, in, in part because of the Gulf War. I, um, I, I was a uh, co-lead a, a group of, of students and uh, to uh, Iraq uh, mm-hmm. uh, just prior to the uh, Gulf War. We were on the last plane out of Baghdad before the bombing began um, in January of, of 1991. And I was and and I was very active in the in the lecture circuit, um, uh, and and this of course after nine eleven, um, uh, even more so, uh, I was one of the, the leading um, uh, voices against the invasion of of Iraq. I was on you know NPR quite a bit to talk of the nation, all things considered, uh, Morning Edition, and and as as well as you know, um, MSNBC, CNN. Uh, BBC and, and others, and I, and I still am occasionally, but particularly in this period. Uh, and, and, and tragically, I, I was pretty prescient about <laughs> what happened. I actually had the cover mm. story in the Nation magazine, The ca- Case Against War, which came out uh, just before the um, uh, Congress voted to approve the uh, war resolution, where I pretty much spelled out uh, the tragedy that would result if we did uh, go ahead. Uh, the issue, the nonviolent action side of it you know, was a natural outgrowth, I think, of... Um, Initially grew out of a, you know, as I mentioned, I came from a Christian pacifist uh, background. I went to Quaker schools, mm-hmm. uh, married a Quaker, <laughs> um, and yeah. and I and I, but I, but it was it was more. I remember being in, in being in a um, in college, being a left wing student activist in the seventies. There was a third world solidarity was you know the big thing at the time, mm-hmm. and um, and this is a time when everybody you know had uh, you know. It, Che posters on their walls, you know, wearing mal caps and all this kind of stuff. And <laughs> and yeah. uh, though in certain ways this, this mm-hmm. is the crowd I hung out with, I was a little uncomfortable with these uh, white middle class students who would never know the horror of counterinsurgency war, romanticizing armed struggle uh, the, the way that they did. Hmm. And um, I uh, uh, and and you know and their angle was hey hey, hey look you, you say you're for nonviolence but you know structural violence you know kills mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, malnutrition preventable diseases I mean that kills ten times more people than behavioral violence you know right. uh, um, and so if you're really it, well, in nonviolence wouldn't you know, if an armed revolution could overthrow an unjust system and establish a, a just system you know that you know, would it would um, yeah, that would seem to be ultimately the more nonviolent approach, mm-hmm. and and I I I could understand that argument, but I, I didn't think it was an either or thing. Right. That the only way to overthrow some right wing dictatorship or whatever was through armed struggle, and that's when I discovered the works of Gene Sharp and George Lakey and others, you know, who had. Um, you know, we're looking at nonviolence more from a strategic uh, perspective. And even though my, my, I, I, I no longer consider myself a strict pacifist, I found that the, um, 
And what I learned in the study of nonviolent action has, has led me to uh, recognize its power mm. and how it is indeed more effective uh, than armed struggle, even in authoritarian situations. And I, through the um, International Center on Nonviolent Conflict and um, uh, Nonviolence International and, and, and other groups, you know, I have uh, uh, co-led workshops, uh, often with veterans of some of these struggles, uh, to uh, activists around the world. And uh, to uh, not not that we tell them what to do or anything like that, but li at least uh, you know uh, uh, explain the, uh, the 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 history and and dynamics uh, and um, uh, of strategic nonviolent action where it has worked before, and they can use or not use <laughs> what they what they know uh, to uh, 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 to support their struggles. There's lots of some weird conspiracy theories, <laughs> but uh, yeah. uh, ironically, uh, you know, because some of these people have struggled against dictatorships that oppose the United States, and so some people on the far left who at one point were dismissing the power of nonviolence out of hand are, are now saying these are all, you know, um, you know uh, the fault of Washington or whatever, but uh -huh. it's kind of silly, but... Um, where that no, I, Gene Sharp is yeah, yeah, somehow right, 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 right. Uh, the CIA. <laughs> yeah. or, right? That's pretty, pretty, pretty crazy, especially given his his own uh, uh, radical history. But um, it, it it's it's been what's been really uh, uh, where I feel really blessed in my life is that I have been able to combine, you know, my um, academic career, my, my first love uh, being teaching, you know, with a very interesting research agenda, but also becoming something of a public intellectual, something of a pundit, and 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 and, and on on issues of U.S. foreign policy, Middle Eastern politics, but also doing some hands-on uh, work, doing doing the kind of workshops and trainings and seminars that I, I've done to uh, activists overseas. Right. Yeah. And in those travels and in your work with overseas activists and revolutionaries, mm -hmm. subalterns, like the Sarawi, um, the Sarawi Polisario Liberation Front, for whom you are a leading voice fighting for national independence, mm -hmm. and social democracy in Western Sahara, or in other famous movements from yeah. like the Zapatistas or the Rojava, has there been anything that you have seen from those struggles that has informed the way that you are looking at the world or... Maybe it's like changed something within your own heart. Well, very much so. I mean, the, the thing, the thing that, uh, especially around uh, in, uh, these uh, works in nonviolent action, the, the techniques and, and and the theories and things like that. I mean, these are these are not stuff that that, that I made up or even Gene Sharp made mm -hmm. up. I mean, these are, you know, basically these are uh, collecting the experiences of oppressed people around the world, primarily people of color. Uh, either in the uh, global south or minorities uh, yeah. in the United States and elsewhere. I mean, these are the, these are the people who pioneered uh, these uh, uh, these, te these techniques of strategic nonviolent actions. These are the ones who have utilized civil resistance. So it's just learning their stories. And, and um, I, I mean, it's really amazing, actually, especially I remember being in Kenya a few years ago, hmm. interviewing people about the nonviolent movement uh, there that... Um, Eventually brought down the Moy regime and and brought and brought uh, constitutional and legal and uh, institutional changes uh, uh, to that to that country. This was during the eighties and nineties, and and um, and it was amazing how eager people were to tell me these stories because, especially in, in like Nairobi, which is overrun with NGOs from mm -hmm. all over, it, they, they were just that that it was like whoa, there's a Westerner who wants to learn from us. <laughs> there's a Westerner right. who wants to listen. And right. not just tell us what to do, and I mean it was so sad that that, uh, that uh, um, they don't get that opportunity that much. Um, but it was I was glad to you know be able to uh, to hear these stories, and um, I, you know, I recently got back from Nepal, which in addition to um, um, going on an amazing uh, trek on the Annapurna circuit. Uh, uh, with my children and, and doing some other uh, outdoor adventuring, I, I spent some time uh, interviewing uh, veterans of the uh, pro-democracy struggle there right. that brought down this 350-year-old monarchy and established the Federal Republic of, of Nepal. And what was interesting about that is that, you know, they had a, a, a bloody Maoist insurgency that had been going on for years, 30,000 people killed. It was, you know, it was really awful. I mean, there's a three-way struggle between the autocratic monarchy and the... Um, 
and the liberal pro-democracy you know, f- forces, um, and largely in the urban areas and in the Maoist insurgency in, in, in the countryside. And the Maoists and the liberals got together. The liberals agreed to adapt a more radical platform, and the Maoists agreed to lay down their arms, and they engaged in protests and general strikes, and um, um, effectively you know, brought, down, brought down the monarchy and, and established this Democratic Republic, and we don't. We, uh, there are a lot of stories mm-hmm. uh, like this we don't hear about. I mean, occasionally, like Egypt, of course, and some of the Eastern European right. examples of, of pro democracy struggles have gotten in the news. But um, there are a lot of lot of others in in, in uh, Africa and, and uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, uh, other parts of the world that we we don't hear uh, nearly enough about. Yeah, and there's been this um, that what you spoke to earlier about. Um, kind of the celebration of Maoism or um, kind of or Che Guevara uh, back in the 70s. There's resurgence of um, uh, that, that that thought hasn't died. Yeah. And there's a lot of that and a lot of folks who doubt the, that nonviolence can be a useful mm. tactic. And so um, I know you've done a lot of work with folks like Gene Sharp and maybe Erica Chenoweth. Mm-hmm. And I wondered if you could um, explain some of the, the data or yeah. the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think... Uh, I think uh, 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 Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan have, have uh, done some of the important um, you know, quantitative uh, work, which has shown that uh, in looking at you know, 350 or so um, uh, movements in the past century that were, and we're not talking about reform movements like civil rights struggle or labor struggle or whatever, we're talking about going for broke, that is mm-hmm. overthrowing a dictatorship, um, uh, anti-colonial struggles, uh, secessionist uh, struggles, I mean, where you're, you're, you're going for it all. Uh, they found that predominantly armed struggles were successful 26% of the time, but primarily nonviolent struggles were successful 53% of the time. They were um, more than twice as likely to succeed. They also demonstrated how the, um, that um, the successful nonviolent struggles Average two years in length, whereas the successful armed struggles were, uh, took at least eight years on average. Uh, one of the more interesting statistic is that um, uh, less than ten percent of the overthrows of autocratic regimes by armed struggles became stable democracies within the next within the subsequent e- few years, whereas over half of the successful nonviolent struggles that overthrew uh, dictatorships uh, became um, stable democracies. And and I I think the reason for that last part is is pretty clear that um, armed struggles, you have this uh, uh, elite vanguard and the power comes to the barrel of the gun. Uh, uh, Military organizations by their nature are hierarchical. And that style continues when the guerrillas end up taking power, whereas Mm -hmm. a successful nonviolent movement you have to build a broad base. There's a lot of give and take uh, of co- building coalition, building alliances. And so that, that more pluralistic ethos mm-hmm. emerges in successful uh, nonviolent uh, uh, struggles. And, and um, <clears throat> but, you know, I've all, one, thing, one thing, in fact, that I also deal a lot with U.S. foreign policy, which I think gives me credibility when I talk about these issues, is I, I, I realize that um, the, um, the United States is the uh, number one uh, backer of uh, dictatorial regimes and occupation armies in the world today. Right. That uh, we we don't, as Americans, we shouldn't be um, talking about uh, nonviolent uh, resistance against dictatorships by oppressed people unless we are willing to engage in nonviolent resistance in this country Preach. to <laughs> challenge uh, Washington's backing of dictatorships around the world. That's that's that is our, um, our our primary our primary responsibility. Yeah. So, what does a Sharpian um, uh, civil resistance look like in this country? How do we uh, break down the power structures, and has that changed uh, since his death and the uh, advent of new technologies? Uh- I mean, certainly, uh, the new technologies uh, can are, are important in terms of uh, communication, but I I I, I think there's sometimes uh, you know people exaggerate uh, the power um, of you know, of 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 uh, the the internet and whatever. Because right. I mean, I've seen uh, <laughs> just, you know, when, when I keep thinking about uh, you know, Mali in 1989, uh, where um, 
not only was there no internet uh, then, um, there was, you know, most people didn't have electricity, so you didn't have much of radio and television, and though half, half the population was illiterate at that time, they spread the world of the revolution using griots. Yeah. The singing storytellers going from village to village. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and, and, and so when people have, have a message to share, when people... Uh, are ready to, to mobilize and people are ready to be mobilized mm. uh, you know, they'll find you know communication yeah. <laughs> so I, that's why I don't like people who call things oh the Facebook revolution oh, yeah. or the Twitter revolution no. yeah. uh, but, but at the same time <laughs> there's certainly some real advantages of being able to uh, use this uh, use this kind of um, a communication but there's really no substitute for um, you know, face-to-face organizing that I, uh, you know, the, the term slacktivism, you know, people think they're making a difference, you know, by, by, by being on the internet and signing onto a petition or whatever. Um, when you really do need to, 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 to go out, or and I think one of the big problems with Occupy was that, um, you know, that, that people were just into sitting down and occupying a space instead of, you know, going door to door and doing the kind of, uh, of, of grassroots mobilizing uh, that is so important. And, and I think we also need to find that balance in terms of um, awareness of the um, um, you know, of, uh, of liberation oppression issues and you know, awareness you know of, of racism and sexism and, and classism and other other issues and and um, heteronormative. I mean, you, you go down the list that that you know being having having awareness and consciousness on these issues is 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 important if we're going to build a movement where everybody feels included. At the same time, uh, we don't want to get so bogged down in the identity politics uh, that we don't get anything done. Yeah, yep. <laughs> and and um, or you know, accusing people of, of you know being uh, racist or sexist da, 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 in, 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 a, in a kind of more in, in impulsive way, and instead of sort of you know, people need to be educated and, and being about every non-target group one can be in. I, I I've had to learn a lot, and there's a lot more I need to learn, uh, but. You know, generally, you know, instead of just kind of attacking people and knocking them, them down, um, and you know, for their lack of awareness, I think it's important to educate and empower people in ways uh, that uh, can, you know, can can, can grow can grow the movement, so that uh, you know mm-hmm. people can, um, um, and so you know, trying to find a balance on those those kinds of issues. I mean, just because somebody not might might not use the um, current uh, you know, politically correct term for something doesn't mean they're the enemy right at the same time it's you know, it, it's also important that people be open to learning what words are important and why they're important right and and, yeah. and try to try try to uh, um, uh, uh, you know be sensitive to, to those sorts of things so finding a balance there that that's on, on the identity politics is, is an important piece another thing that I, I'd mention is is to um, uh, recognize that we need to think strategically, um, and just as a guerrilla army is not going to win if they, um, you know, you know, at, uh, attack the same place um, repeatedly, yeah, <laughs> um, or use the same kind of tactic. That uh, you know, movement. There are hundreds of forms of nonviolent action uh, that that can be utilized, uh, and you need to think about. What is the logical sequencing of tactics? You know, who, mm-hmm. what is, what is your specific goal? Uh, who are you trying to win over? Uh, how, what tactics are effective in winning the segment of the population over? And remember, you don't have to get everybody on your side to win, but if you can get an, uh, an, an a, a passive supporter to become an active supporter, if you can get a active opponent to be a passive opponent mm-hmm. uh, you know if you, if, you, if you move just you know people even just a notch or two in your direction it could um, it could really um, you know, make a difference and also to realize it's, it, it, it's you, you can uh, even if even if your goal is a radical revolutionary transformation of society that you um, you uh, that it's important to have uh, intermediate goals that are consistent with your long range vision, mm-hmm. but are more achievable yeah. because you want to have victories. You yeah. want people to know that hey, we can win this. And um, I mean, I think for example, you, you look at uh, what the what the solidarity movement did in Poland, which was so effective. 
was that even though you know they would want to see the communist communist system fall and have a more democratic system, they uh, ended up instead of you know marching into downtown Warsaw, occupying the main square there, and demanding that the communist mm-hmm. system fell. They went on strike at the Gdansk shipyards, and they had a few you know, basic demands about rehiring some fire workers and a few workplace issues. Mm-hmm. But the main thing was recognize an independent trade union, mm-hmm. uh, not and, and which they did. And it was not just for not just for the uh, the dock workers in Gdansk, and not just for dock workers elsewhere in Poland, uh, but for everybody. So industrial workers. Um, Farmers, intellectuals, government workers, yeah. you know, all could join solidarity. Within months, there were millions of people who signed up and they kept having more and more you know, incremental demands. Uh, eventually, the communist authorities had 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 enough. About a year and a half later, they declared martial law. But by, by that time, the movement was big enough. They could continue underground even when their leaders were arrested. And the, the government finally had to lift, you know, martial law eight years later. Um, and have um, uh, have elections, which solidarity ended up sweeping, and uh, that was and, and that was the end of that and and end of the communist dictatorship there. Uh, contrast this to China, where they all sat down in Tiananmen Square and demanded the fall of the system, mm-hmm. and and they got massacred and 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 the movement uh, w- 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 was crushed. So, um, and one can certainly um, you know. Uh, I mean, have certain criticisms of solidarity. Uh, uh, like Valencia was not a particularly good president. Of course, right now they have a really awful, really awful government right there. Mm. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but the, my my point being is is the, though that um, that I think it's a good example of of the importance of having some specific, achievable, short term goals in your struggle that are consistent with your more long term revolutionary mm. or radical. Uh, a, a vision that that it, we can't expect to to have it have it all uh, have, have it all at once. We want to empower people to to have, have victories where they can celebrate, and and it's empowering to win. Yeah. it's empowering to win, and it realizes you that hey yeah, hey you can do more. You can you can you can get more. Another thing uh, is I think there needs to be a balance in terms of of um, or, or, um in in terms of uh, having a, a democratic open system. And um, in leadership, that you don't want to have a, a hierarchical organization that get, becomes you know bureaucratic and like a lot of reform groups, they become almost more centered mm-hmm. on raising money for their organization than the broader right. broader cause. You get bureaucratized, often get compromised, you know, in terms of uh, you know getting a seat at the table and that kind of thing. On uh, the other extreme, you know, you have have those that are. Um, uh, in, in the name of, of anarchism or in, in a decentralization, right. the, off, the loudest voices in the room end up dominating, uh, which are often not the most rational ones, tend to mm. be uh, um, uh, disproportionately um, white males, <laughs> and um, tend to um, make it um, more, uh, you know, that, that, um, that, and end up making it uh, almost takes on every anything goes kind of attitude, where you know you know people say, oh, it's just my individual liberty to um, throw projectiles at cops and, and and smash windows, even though it ends up you know harming the the, the movement. It was real disappointing, you know, to see this happen in, in at Occupy Oakland on the day that you know ten thousand people nonviolently shut down the. Um, Port of Oakland, <laughs> right? And uh, you know, in, in a general strike, I and mean, the biggest general strike in in in, in, uh, in the United States in like sixty years, and and late that night, some people just ended up, you know, trashing buildings, including locally owned minority businesses, uh, smashing windows and doing crazy stuff, and that was what was in the headlines and on the news the next day. Yeah. And similarly with Seattle, I was there in the WTO demonstration. We had oh, yeah. we had a you know fifty thousand people in a legal labor led march. We had ten thousand people nonviolently shut down the opening session of the WTO, but it was maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty self styled anarchists that were smashing windows and and, and uh and throwing things at cops. There that that's what 
you know, people think of when they think look at Seattle because that's what got most of the of, of the of the news coverage. Because you don't want to when people ask me, you know, mm-hmm. well, is this violent? Is this what, what, fine? What's violent? Fine? What's nonviolent? I don't care what's violent. What's <laughs> nonviolent? What works? What is it? Yeah. Build the movement or does it hurt the movement? I mean, you're not going to get you know parents and their kids coming out to a demonstration where there's going to be. When, 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 when a few people out of their sort of individual right to do so, in their view, start throwing things, at, at, uh, start throwing objects, and then the cops start firing tear gas, you know, that, that you want something that will grow the movement. And, and these kind of violent tactics uh, do, not, um, do not tend to, uh, to, uh, to grow, grow the movement. Um, so, you know, pe- so people need to be really, really smart about, uh, about those, those, those things. And that includes... You know, if you're going to be part of a particular demonstration, a particular action, or you know, a particular group, you say you, you're going to have to agree to certain rules, and among these are, um, you know, commitment to nonviolence, spelling out what that means. Mm. And if um, and if you want to do your thing, do your thing, but not don't you're not part of this particular action. And so I think people should not be afraid of being very very clear about that, um, because you know the successful movements we have had were those where there was mandatory nonviolence training. Yeah. And there was mandatory, um, you know, agreement on, on certain guidelines of how you behave, and that, um, and 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 some of them, like the Clamshell Alliance, uh, Abalone Alliance, a lot of the anti-nuclear groups, they were radically decentralized. They worked by consensus. They used right. affinity groups. You know, right. they were they were essentially anarchists. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. So so, so 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 you know we're not we're so we're not. Yeah. Um, and, and 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 so I'm not I I'm not I'm not dissing uh you know the 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 the, the anarchist tradition at all. Mm, yeah. Um, but it's a um. But but uh, but anarchism is doesn't isn't some infantile thing. Everybody do their own thing. Uh, you need to think in terms of the collective good if you're going to you know be in a decentralist kind of uh, of uh, of a uh, movement. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that, and I'd love to dive deeper into various political theories mm-hmm. like anarchism with you. It it seems in our own social movements, however, that we've struggled to stay clear sighted in our strategy to to influence and overturn the powers that be. Erica Chenoweth, uh, I believe, showed that in our in order to most directly impact the percentage chance of completing a revolution, the most important groups to target mm-hmm. um, or to get on your side or at least induce compliance in are uh, bureaucrats and security forces. Security forces whom in our well-justified anger we are alienating rather than building solidarity with and the common knowledge that uh, the oppressive myths of our political system are harmful to everyone. Given that data, or the data that Mm -hmm. Chenoweth offers, what role does um, converting the enforcers of hegemony take in our own radical movements and revolutionary struggles? Uh, In most of her work, I think she's been looking at at truly revolutionary situations where you're trying Mm -hmm. to bring down a regime. And in that case, um, obviously, the um, uh, you know the, 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 the success is is de- is not one hundred percent determined, but a hugely important variable hmm. is the um, is, is is defections and non cooperations by security forces and and and, and government workers. Uh, and it, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to tear off the uniforms and join the revolution. <laughs> it just means that they, you know, might uh, um, just sit back and let the, let the demonstration go through, or you know, they they might end up, in order to dispatch to a certain place, end up just kind of going somewhere else and hanging out. Uh, similarly, a bureaucrat, you know, may not you know quit the government and go out into the streets. But they may misplace a file, or mm. or, or, or um, delete uh, something on the computer, or or be slow to pass on an order, or you know there's a lot of ways of non-cooperation. You know besides you know open open rebellion. And in situations where where you know we're 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 not quite at a revolutionary situation, there are um, you know we we can't it, it's it's somewhat somewhat harder to. Um, Expect you know, wholesale defections, but these these sorts of things can 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 happen a, a, as well. And certainly, uh, when I was in, involved in in in, 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 in civil disobedience and, and and certain nonviolent direct actions and things like that, we would we would meet the police beforehand, tell them exactly what we're going to do, and um, and that we were committed to nonviolence. And and uh, you know, often uh, they would let us get away with a lot of things we didn't think we would get away with. Yeah. Whereas if they're on edge, they're afraid, they don't know what to expect, you know, the tendency to to react. Um, 
would be, uh, you know, in a negative, negative, uh, in, a, in a violent way, uh, is, um, I mean, you know, again, it's a matter of, a matter of, of being smart, uh, smart about things. And again, it's, you don't, I'm not talking about being naive about the nature of, of, um, of, uh, of certain oppressive institutions. Uh, but, um, at, at the same time, we don't want to provoke the, their, their worst elements either. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to the question of technology, um, I think a lot of people forget that technology, uh, not only can be this democratizing force that people thought it was in the nineties or something like mm. that, but, um, if you, uh, take, um, there's a lot of alternative, really negative things that can come out of it. And if you look at China right now with the Uyghur people, mm. um, and state capitalism, surveillance state mm -hmm. capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, there's this, this huge oppressive force, uh, that it, it, you know, if you watch uh, or you read about it, mm -hmm. it's just almost unimaginable yeah. mm -hmm. that um, these people in the Xinjiang province mm -hmm. uh, might um, f find a way out. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what you think about the future of things like the social credit system that they're using and uh, surveillance technologies. How do movements get around mm -hmm. um, those kind of powerful technological tools for mm -hmm. oppression? Uh, I mean, what, what they're Throughout history, there have been new uh, technologies of repression, and movements have sooner or later figured out how to get around them. Yeah. Uh, that uh, um, unless we get to you know to a point, uh, you know, some centuries from now, where artificial intelligence you know, gets to be you know, totally in control, <laughs> control of things, we are talking about human beings that are ultimately behind these right. these sorts of things, and. Uh, and and uh, that you know that getting non cooperation with people who pro who do these program who program the computers who, who do these things is is, is certainly um is certainly uh, um uh, one one piece, and of course you know there's all all sorts of um uh you know um opportunities for hacktivists and for um for and for using new technologies to kind of get around around uh, around these things. Um, I mean, I, I've seen, I mean, you know, I, I've occasionally hear little creative examples of of, um, of when you know, when, when uh, like the Israelis uh, during the first Intifada, you know, they had they had, they had they were wondering why the um, the guidelines for nonviolent resistance, the occupation, you know, the you know the saying mm -hmm. when the general strike will be, when the, which which uh, Israeli companies are targeting, when we're doing this protest, whatever, were word for word. In the different t Palestinian towns, you know, when they cut off uh, all computer, all all telephone, all other kind of communications, they are checking every single vehicle that came through and, and searching mm -hmm. everything. And, they, and but, but, but interesting, the leaflets were not didn't. I mean, the words were almost exactly the same, but they looked looked very different. And they found out that the people were just coming and mem memorizing word for word each little section, <laughs> and then. When they got to the other village, rewriting the whole thing up, you know. Wow. I mean, and just little, you know, and I keep hearing similar stories, you know, of, of, of people who just using, you know, um, all, all sorts of little, you know, uh, you know, things to get around, um, you know, the, this kind of um, uh, this kind of repression. But it's also the, the the fact is is that when I when I think about China, is yeah. that um, sooner or later, the, 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 you know, they're. They're not going to keep. They're, they're being able to keep a lid on things because the economy has been growing so darn fast. Right. And um, yeah. I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. it, it's amazing how that society has advanced. In many ways, leapfrog the United States in a lot of ways. Yeah. When you're, I was thinking about this a lot when I was, you know, zooming through uh, rural China, two hundred fifty miles an hour on high speed rail, <laughs> and you know, wondering why the hell can we have that kind of thing in our country? Um, but soon, you know, sooner or later. The bubble is going to burst, and I think we're really going. This is what happened in Indonesia. Indonesia was growing like crazy, mm -hmm. and and uh, under Saharto and Golkar, they they it was it was, it was a very uh, uh, repressive society. I mean, they had they had party people in every neighborhood, every block. I mean, they had that they it was it was a pretty, almost a totalitarian kind of system, not just authoritarian, but totalitarian. But when the bubble burst there. The economic collapse, the people sprung up, and and I had a feeling I was there just before this all happened, and I and and and, and you know at that time, if you were going to organize a, a any kind of NGO, you had to get it approved by the government, 
And so they're forming these NGOs, the innocuous names like the um, um, uh, Women's Entrepreneurial Empowerment Association or the Muslim Youth Soccer League, um, which in addition to you know, doing what they were doing, were into training and organizing and mobilizing people uh, in terms of, uh, of, 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 of civil society and civil resistance. Yeah. And so when the thing collapsed, all these groups could suddenly whoosh, mobilize in mass action and bring down uh, the, you know, one of those horrible dictators of the 20th century. I mean, Saharto was responsible you know, for... for um, up to three quarters of a million deaths hmm. and during his um, um, a 35 year reign of terror in both Indonesia and East Timor, which uh, Indonesia occupied for a number of years, and and so I, I could and, and we look at look at China, you know, where you have this this um, you know million tens uh, you know hundreds of millions of people really who have um, been forced out of their homes and villages to um, work in these sweatshops and urban areas so they're completely alienated from, you know, they, they've lost their family, their tradition, they're, they're being exploited as, as, as hell. Um, on top of that, you know, they, uh, because of the sex-selective abortion, there is a huge uh, glut of men compared to women. Um, you know, so, you know, they're, they're, they're having a hard time finding, you know, uh, partners or, 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 or um uh, you know, either sexual partners or life partners, and so you know, the frustration you'd imagine is is going through the going through the roof, and I, I can't imagine there's not going to be some kind of um, a, a pretty uh, uh, yeah, there's going to be some kind of a massive resistance challenging the system. So I I, I don't see China as a you know you know a, in 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 several structures you know going yeah. uh, uh, having to you know lasting forever uh, because. Um, you know, pretty soon, sooner or later, people have enough. Have had enough. Uh, these kinds of, uh, of authoritarian systems. Also, when you don't have the kind of self-correcting mechanisms that more pluralistic democratic societies mm. have, uh, they do stupid mistakes. They end up focusing on staying in power rather than improving society. And sometimes you do have, an, you occasionally will have an enlightened authoritarian system that will, you know, will try to do both. But generally, uh, greed and avarice, uh, you know, um, and and, uh, and 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 just the the, the um, and hubris, <laughs> end up um, being such that the the, the system sooner or later uh, collapses. Yeah. So I want to switch topics real quick. Um, so uh, there's been a huge uh, rise in nationalism in the past um, few years. It's extremely well documented. And I just wanted uh, to start off by asking if you have um, uh, any input in, into uh, what's fueling that. Well, I, I, I see neoliberalism, I think, is the main thing. <laughs> and, and, and it's that um, the, uh, um, the idea that the, the primacy of, of, of the markets um, has, you know, allow and, and, and the so-called free trade uh, has uh, increased uh, the uh, economic growth and made some people very rich, um, but has left a whole lot of people behind. And the the system the system is such um, that uh, they don't want people to recognize the the role of capitalism <laughs> and the failure of government to put take capitalism under control. Instead, try to find scapegoats. In the form of immigrants or minorities or other nations, hmm. and um, people. I mean, I think one thing about uh, capitalism is, is, is the social dislocation. Right. You know that, yeah. that people do have to leave their communities. Um, that uh, material materialism becomes the, the factor, and 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 the kind of alienation that has, and hmm. and people really do need a sense of, of identity, and so the nation state ends up playing that. Um, you know that that kind of kind of role. Uh, I mean, it, it's it, I mean it's it's, it's um, you know the same reason that people get really passionate about um, sports teams, right, or whatever. I mean, I you know I you know growing up in Chapel Hill, I've been a big fan of Tar Heel basketball, and you know it's easy to see. Oh, the ref is always biased against the Tar Heels, mm. or oh that wasn't a charge. He, 
you know, yeah, there was a foul, that was a charge. You had position, you know, it wouldn't no matter what the instant replay actually says, you know, because you, cause you really want to believe in your team, you identify your team, when your team does well, you're happy. When your team does poorly, you, you feel bad. And, you know, there have been people who basically, this this, this phenomenon we see in, 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 you know, think of all sorts of other areas in life this pertains to, uh, you know, you know, the idea, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, you want to believe in something so much, um, you know, the old stereotype, if your, your lover is cheating on you, you're the last to know because you want to believe in that person. I mean, I can give all sorts of, of, of analogies, but what, what happens is that you end up being, um, you're really believing in the nation state, uh, and it becomes part of your identity. And so you, and, and, and so as you become more and more alienated, and your life is, is less and less what you want it to be. You have less and less a sense of community. Um, you embrace the nation state. You, you embrace the nationalism with an with a even greater and greater fervor. And you start uh, believing that your country, your leader, you know, can, can do no wrong. And it's the fault of everybody else. And, uh, and, and, and the media and other things are, are reinforcing that. And one thing that's disturbing, you know, you talked about about the the the, the, um, the internet and how authoritarian technologies and how authoritarians, you know, have 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 used that. You know, one one thing that that that, that people you know start uh, start believing um, things that they they see in their own 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 circles. I mean, I um, and they don't get that information. I mentioned growing up watching Walter Cronkite. You know that. We just, you know, we had, we had the almost all, all news we had, you know, was that of the, of the three major networks and, mm-hmm. and the, and the, um, the newspapers, which, uh, it became more and more concentrated in, in corporate hands. Um, but at least everybody watched the same news shows. Everybody okay. read the same newspapers. Now, the good news is that, you know, you can get good alternative news now. You don't have to rely on the corporate uh, media. Uh, but at the same time, you tend to start looking at websites that reinforce views you already have, mm. and this, and this, and and, and, and you know the right wing racists and nationalists and everybody, you know, start looking at their own websites and whatever. But unfortunately, there's some elements on the left that yeah. also end up with some of these far left conspiratorial, you know, kind of things that are, are ridiculously simplistic, and. Um, End up distracting you know people from the from the weir, from the real struggles, who spend mm-hmm. half their time attacking other leftists for not, you know, uh, you know for for not agreeing with their conspiracy theories or or, or whatever. And um, we and 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 it, it it's um, so I think it's it's really really important to sort of um, understand uh, that you know that we, we really. Um, Facts matter, <laughs> right? Yeah. And um, that it's, it's important to um, uh, question your sources, even if they come from places that you may feel an ideological uh, affinity, and to um, uh, try to um, and and and, to, and to going back to the earlier question about building a movement, you know, to that. Uh, you don't just want to, you know, hang out with people you're comfortable with. You need to, to be with people who you may disagree with. I think it mm-hmm. was um, um, Bernice Johnson Regan, um, yeah. a musicologist, African American um, singer, civil rights activist. She said something along the lines of, um, "If you're um, comfortable with everybody in a coalition, you're not in a coalition." Um, that uh, we yeah. do need to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to to. Um, you know, be with people not just from different class and, and racial backgrounds, but um, also from you know different uh, different uh, political opinions, uh, and to uh, to do a lot of listening. Uh, and and uh, the more we do that, I think the more effective we'll be as as uh, agents for change. Yeah, absolutely. I I think that call for pluralism is is huge, and you know, where there's definitely this search for identity, and we're doing that through filter bubbles and the alienation, and fueled by, like you were saying, the, that alienation uh, brought about um, by capitalism. But um, I guess uh, a big question that's coming up uh, for the next fifty to hundred years is what we've got these, um, you know, we've got this nationalist resurgence, but we also have kind of neo-tribalism. And then we've got these other forces kind of coming in with, um, you know, global climate change or nuclear warfare or um, uh, technological disruptions that um, are really calling for some sort of 
not government, but governance that uh, mm -hmm. works between nations uh, to um, ensure that we're not dooming yeah. ourselves. Mm -hmm. So what do you see um, as like the future as we're trying to restructure those communities, mm -hmm. um, but also uh, keep ourselves alive? Yeah. I, I, I think um, th we're already seeing a lot of really exciting work. Uh, everything from... Um, you know, uh, new appropriate technologies around mm. renewable energy and, and, and the like. Um, and the fact that what new technologies enables us to communicate, you know, uh, 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 with, uh, with other people. I mean, it's interesting. One of the issues, I mean, uh, that, that where there's the biggest gap in political opinion in the United States between uh, 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 millennials and an uh, and older generation is on Israel and Palestine mm. because... Um, <laughs> Uh, young people can actually, you know, you know uh, can tend to get most of their news, you know, from from you know, via the internet, which includes you know, people in the West Bank, you know, or, or you know, in or in the of these other struggles, um, you know, telling their stories and, and and seeing footage and things like that. Whereas older generations, what they learned about. Israel Palestine was you know more from the corporate media, which you know, tend to be uh, allied with Israel. Just the corporate media tends to, to uh, support other U.S. allies, you know, regardless of their, their human rights abuses. Hmm. And and I, I, I'm using that example just to yeah. explain a bigger phenomenon that um, we you know we're we're there in addition to the globalization from above, you know through the IMF, WTO, and the you know the the whole neoliberal model. Um, we also have globalization from below, uh, yeah. and, and uh, that um, you know, if a um, trade union activist uh, in a, a in a authoritarian uh, country in the global south, uh, uh, you know, uh, was uh, was arrested um, you know, twenty thirty years ago, uh, by the time that uh, people found out about it, uh, he would have been tortured to death. Yeah. Now people can instantly get the word out, and people can instantly mobilize, mm -hmm. and not just start, you know, um, you know, contacting the the government, uh, but forcing their own governments to contact that government, right? And uh, and 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 you know, and, and get the authorities to say, hey, we know we have, they know they we have this guy, we have, we're gonna have to go easy on him. Um, so. This ability to uh, you know to, to mobilize uh, for civil so global civil society to mobilize is of is of critical uh, importance, and I think it's one of our big big hopes. And I think with with the, the threat of climate change, I mean it's, it's it's scary as hell to be sure, but I think it's something that it so lays bare the uh, how screwed up the system is. I mean here's something that all the scientists agree is threatening humanity. And yet, global capitalism and global uh, uh, and, and and nation states, including the supposedly democratic ones, uh, uh, are are not addressing it with the urgency that it deserves. Right. And that ex right there exposes you know you know that uh, you know that you know not just that we have a danger danger there's a big danger here that people have to mobilize to to uh, uh, to challenge. But it also exposes the whole nature of the freaking system. I mean, that's what happened to my generation on Vietnam. I mean, the, the mainstream media and every uh, the politicians, both parties, everybody was supporting the Vietnam War, including liberals. And then gradually, and, and, and you know, this is a tiny group of uh, pacifists and leftists and mm. and you know people who actually knew about Indochina <laughs> that um, that were challenging it. But you know, as as you know, and and and, and so when people started hearing questions, is why is the United States, which supports free and democracy all over the world, doing this terrible stuff in Vietnam? And they looked into it a little more and thought, hey, wait a minute, we don't support free and democracy all over the world. The U.S. is an imperialist power, doing all those terrible mm. things. So why is a country that's so great and free and wonderful, the United States at home, doing all these terrible things abroad? And they start saying, well, there's institutionalized racism and there's sexism and there's and there's capitalism and there's this and 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 and, and right. because Vietnam radicalized a generation. Vietnam was the piece that sort of opened the crack in the door 
Mm. Before it all, and then before people start, oh boy, so that's what's behind it. That that explains it. That the Vietnam yeah. was not a fluke. It was just one manifestation of the whole military industrial yeah. capitalist system, patriarchal system, and 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 of course, it's, it's no accident that the modern day women's movement, the you know, gay liberation movement, the environmental movement, all sprung out of. The anti-Vietnam War movement, right. and and so so just as Vietnam in this country served as a catalyst for P- and, and in fact the whole counterculture for that matter, yeah, yeah. the whole counterculture, yeah, um, and and that uh, uh, um, and and what climate change does is yeah. that that offers exactly. that for the whole world, yeah, because people can get, get start oh climate change that's bad well let's do something wow. about it. why isn't the government doing something about it you know. Gee, you know, these powerful corporations have all this influence, and and da da da, da. and 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 again, it'll open, it, I think this is going to again radicalize a, a whole generation globally, yeah, right? Uh, because of the urgency of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, the uh, and 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 so I I I think that we really do have a chance of, I mean, I think of the thing about the Chinese character for crisis is a compound word of danger and opportunity. Right. And that's exactly what the, um, you know, the, the climate crisis, you know, has uh, with us is that it, it uh, I mean, the danger is pretty obvious, but it's an opportunity mm. to build the kind of movements to make the kind of, 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 of uh, um, uh, empowerment of global civil society uh, to create the more radical changes that we need overall. Right. I, I was so hoping I, I started to see that story you were going and it was just like it was a wonderful moment right now. Yeah. Just just listening to you uh, connect those two things, Vietnam War and uh, climate change. Um, so, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, global system change at some level, mm-hmm. which is a wild idea. Perhaps it's just a wild idea, but uh, I want to play with that for just a second mm-hmm. um, and think about, uh, you know, what we could become. And so if. If we have, um, when we're talking about governance, um, I'm wondering if we went back 60, is 68 years or 69, if we went all the way back to the beginning of the UN mm-hmm. and uh, you were the one to draft the proposal for how the UN would be structured, mm-hmm. how what would a, zoo, a ZUNES United <laughs> Nations look like? Uh- Seventy-four years, actually. But so, uh, yeah, you, yeah, I, yeah, I think I knew you would. <laughs> it, it, it's um. I mean, I, the United Nations, you know, was, um, you know, based on this, you know, liberal ideal mm-hmm. um, that, um, um, but there was a contradiction there. I mean, the preamble starts with, we the people of the United Nations. But if you look at the charter itself, it's all about governments. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Oh. And, I, and I think, uh, you know, it certainly would have been, been one that, uh, that, that would have been, um, uh, more, more, more people-centered, more, more democratic, um, and of course, you know, more, more important, enforceable. You know that I, I've, uh, that I, I do. Uh, there is a place for international law. Unfortunately, I mean, it was, it was uh, one of the things I remember at the time of the. Um, we were going the opposite direction. Unfortunately, I mean, um, back. Uh, I'm mean, for the first uh, election campaign I remember was 1964 when the uh, Republican nominee was a very conservative uh, senator named Barry Goldwater mm-hmm. uh, from Arizona, and he was considered really dangerous because he acted like the U- United States was not liable, but f- did not have to obey the UN Charter, that which was premised on the idea of non-aggression, and so we have a right to you know um, uh, to to invade. Uh, countries and overthrow their governments that we think in, in, in not, that we might, they might potentially be a threat someday. And that was considered really radical and crazy. It was called Bang Bang Barry. You know, even even most Republicans yeah. thought he was a little he was a little too far out there. Mm-hmm. But lo and behold, you know, along comes Bush and the invasion of Iraq, and not only do almost all the Republicans uh, 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 buy into that concept, but a large minority of Democrats, uh, in, including. Uh, Hillary Clinton and, and, and John Kerry and Diane Feinstein and Chuck Schumer and Harry Reid and Joe Biden. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so it, it, it's, um, and so, you know, I, I, and so here I was in 2002, early 2003, going, lecturing nationally, just trying to say, hey, folks, this is really terrible. I'm thinking, you know, in my, <clears throat> my, my, my youth, I was looking for, you know, revolutionary transformation. And now I'm just, fighting a losing battle to save the liberalism of my parents' generation. Mm. Um, but I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the reason that the um, 
UN system failed. I mean, you know, the, the US, you know, yeah. during during the you know, past um, you know, fifty years, the uh, you know, United States has used its you know veto power more than all the other countries in the Security Council combined. Um, and uh, and you know, we complain when you know, Russia and has used its veto power on Syria and other things, which I agree is horrible. But you know, we're, we've been even worse at that. Uh, that to have this kind of, the, you know, the, I would have certainly not had a veto power if, if I was writing the, writing the, the UN Charter. Um, but I would have I, I would have had some enforce enforcement um, uh, you know mechanisms, you know that because um, we do need uh, we do need uh, international law is important. That uh, and 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 it's not 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 that radical. I mean, saying you can't invade other countries, or you can't torture people, or you uh, you, you can't uh, expand your territory by military force, uh, you can't uh, 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 turn away uh, refugees. Um, you know, things yeah. things like, things like that are pretty pretty basic, and it's it's hard to even even think about um, having a, a more radical progressive UN vision when we can't even live up to what's already. Uh, codified right. in yes. international law, <laughs> so yeah. uh, I would. Um, and so it's, it's really funny because often people, you know, uh, you know, my cr- have critics who uh, act, you know, act like I'm some kind of crazy radical. But it's funny that <laughs> that the biggest criticism I've gotten, you know, uh, you know, from Fox News and from you know other and and other other places that that tend to tend to go after me, it's not for, been for my radical beliefs regarding. Um, uh, you know, capitalism or or, or, or uh, uh, militarism or patriarchy mm. has been for my liberal beliefs. You know, the you know uh, 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 really? opposing uh, illegal wars, opposing <laughs> military occupations, right. opposing you know the, the kind of you know kind of things that are sort of uh, which I, I, I you would think by the stage in twenty first century would we would have figured out by now, but which were indeed already codified in the nineteen forty five UN Charter and in nineteen forty nine uh, with the uh, Fourth Geneva Conventions. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know. So I'm, so so here I am, you know, saying uh, you know, our government should have this mid twentieth century, uh, subscribe to mid twentieth century liberal values, um, and uh, we shouldn't nominate Joe Biden who rejects those. It's like, oh, you're being a purist, you know, you're being far left, you're being, you know, whatever. <laughs> and it's, yeah. and, and you know, what I'm talking about here is actually pretty pretty modest. Yeah, that's excellent, Stephen. Um, so we're going to finish up here in just a second, but I was wondering if you'd like to share maybe um, three books that um, uh, if you could have anyone uh, yeah, anyone who's listening, those are the three books they should read. What what books would you recommend? Well, I, 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 th- I think um, that's, that's a hard one. I, I think um, if you are um, uh, interested in... Um, I I I this may be a little surprise of, of but I will I'll talk a, a, about some fic, start with fiction. Um you're interested in anarchism. I, I think Ursula Le Guin's novel The Dispossessed oh, yeah. is is really interesting because I think it, it shows, you know, both the promise but also some of the difficulties in actually, you know, you know working in a society uh, that under under that kind of uh, radical um uh de- decentralism. Um and one that has a nice kind of futuristic uh, vision uh, would be uh, Starhawk's uh, Fifth Sacred Thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's um, you know, set here in California up in the year 2048. And uh, um, it's, uh, it has sort of a utopian kind of uh, scenario, but also a, um, a dystopian um, a rival uh, a system. Uh, interesting located in Southern California. Yeah. Uh, and um, that, that was that's also very um, uh, uh, very very powerful. Um, well, I, I highly recommend the, uh, in terms of of, non, of uh, nonfiction uh, the writings of uh, Rebecca Solnit. Um, one book I particularly um, enjoyed um, um, uh, you know, reading was Paradise Built in Hell, oh. which looks at a series of major natural disasters. Um, that uh, and uh, that, that that took the place the uh, the San Francisco uh, earthquake uh, both 1906 and 1989 um, and uh, Hurricane Katrina and and and, 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 and a number of others um, where you know, despite our stereotype of kind of light both light boat lifeboat ethics of all against all and you know and, and uh, a Hobbesian kind of a situation mm-hmm. that in fact people were amazingly 
at amazing at coming together, working cooperatively, and and really and helping each other out, mm. uh, and um, everything rescuing people to directing traffic to, to getting supplies to, to people spontaneously uh, de- in, a, in a decentralized uh, democratic manner. And often things got screwed up when the state came in, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and uh, uh, but. Um, and I think it, 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 given that we very well may be approaching some uh, more and more disasters with climate change and other things, uh, I think the book's an important uh, reminder of, of what uh, you know, people can do cooperatively, um, uh, even in very desperate situations. So I think it, it's a very it's a very hopeful book. I think a very very practical book uh, because unfortunately we're going to have to we may be dealing with just these kind of uh, terrible scenarios in the future. Yeah, that is an excellent note to end on. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you. Appreciate it.